Good afternoon, and I would like to uh, add my welcome to that you've already received. Um, I have an interesting task today. Uh, this is uh, past the 56th anniversary of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, but this is only the fourth uh, year that we have had a ceremony that we dubbed uh, on becoming a physician. Uh, we thought about dubbing it on becoming a doctor, but the acronym was OBAD, and that didn't seem to be really good. <laughs> so uh, now it's OBAP. Um, but it is a white coat ceremony uh, by any other name. Um, and uh, there was a lot of reluctance uh, about having this ceremony, which is why for the first 52 years of Einstein we didn't have one. Uh, and it probably is uh, worthwhile uh, pursuing a little bit of a discussion, which I, I plan to do today. Discussion means I talk and you listen. Uh, <laughs> on what we can learn from the previous reluctance about having uh, a white coat ceremony. Uh, can I have the first slide, Chuck? So the students have already been introduced to the fact that we do think there's proper attire and proper comportment uh, that a physician or even a physician in training might have. Uh, and they've seen uh, in the past uh, the dean, uh, the senior associate dean for students, sorry, I go back. Um, and uh, this person here. And then a few minutes later, they saw this person in this attire. And of course, the question arises, you certainly might think about uh, introducing this person to your parents as the senior associate dean for students, but you'd probably be a little reluctant to introduce this person. So dress is relatively important. So there are other thoughts about a ceremony presenting white coats. And it is a ceremony of symbols, as the dean uh, alluded to. And one of the reluctances in the past about having a white coat ceremony at the very beginning of your training related to the fact that folks thought that maybe you really didn't deserve it yet. You were young, you were uninitiated, untrained, and bestowing on you a symbol of uh, the physician, if you will, may have been uh, premature. Um, um, and uh, I think what, what won out was uh, basically a Chinese proverb that states the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago, and the next best time to plant it is today. So we did initiate a white coat ceremony. Other reluctance related to the fact that people felt that in donning a white coat, or any coat, one uh, prevented oneself from being close to the patient. So you put on a coat of armor, like an armadillo, and you said, I'm in here, and you're out there, uh, and never the twain shall meet. Uh, so that was one argument that we had to get over. Uh, insulating yourself and armoring yourself against uh, compassion and humanism, perhaps. And there is some basis for that. Um, in the Middle Ages and right up to the 17th century, uh, there was a figure called the Doctor of the Plague. And the doctor uh, dressed uh, himself, there probably were no herselves at that time, uh, in a gown to protect him, and uh, also wore a mask that he filled with uh, a nosegay of sweet-smelling flowers. Now, I am actually an infectious disease physician by training, so I actually have one of these. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, find it useful from time to time. Uh, another issue is that the Brits have now decided that white coats are actually bad when it comes to infection control. And they particularly single out medical students are more likely to be bacteriologically contaminated at points of frequent, fre frequent contact, such as the sleeve in the pocket. And they point out that although students understood that cleanliness did correlate with bacterial contamination, that a significant proportion of students only laundered their coats occasionally. Um, the Brits still have, have mandated that white coats are out, as are neckties. But uh, a little bit more sinisterly, uh, one of the things uh, is that white coats and the fact of being a physician have often in the past been used for somewhat nefarious uh, goals. Uh, the power and respect conferred upon one by wearing a white coat and either being or pretending to be a physician uh, was used to entice and sell people on things. So this apparent doctor in the white coat. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. The syntax is actually not correct, but that's OK. Uh, and uh, another example. 
Chuck, help me out. Ah, so here, not only is there a physician with his uh, Roosevelt-like uh, uh, glasses on, uh, but there's a, a false statistical analysis here. I don't know how they knew that 20,679 and not 20,678 physicians uh, say that luckies are less irritating, but uh, be that as it may. And of course, uh, the advent of the Second World War, in addition to uh, fostering Rosie the Riveter and showing that women uh, could work just as hard uh, and as productively as men, fostered more women in medical school, and this was an equal opportunity to exploit women as physicians. Uh, and that we're paying for the result of that now in that lung cancer in women has become a huge uh, medical problem. So equal opportunity exploitation. Much more malicious and awful than any of these examples of the exploitation of the white coat uh, is this example. Uh, the Nazi doctors and what they performed, their pseudo and non-science in the name of medicine and science, uh, remains as one of the most horrible events uh, of our history. Uh, doctors and pseudo-medicine, again, were used to uh, racially profile people. Uh, eye color and eye size uh, were used to uh, identify people who were no longer thought to be uh, really human and could be easily done away with. In more recent times, in this, in this country, uh, the uh, infamous Tuskegee experiment uh, in which uh, black patients were denied treatment for syphilis to see how things turned out without treatment really remains a black stain uh, on our white coats. Again, recently, uh, doctors or pseudo-doctors, uh, Dr. Jarvik is a doctor, but he's not a medical doctor, and I guess they tried to get away with that by not having him wear a tie, showing that he was a laboratory doctor and not a practicing physician, but at any rate, for Many years this ad ran about cholesterol, and Dr. Jarvik really has no expertise whatsoever to talk about cholesterol, although he's a rather clever and, and accomplished fellow who invented uh, an artificial heart. Again, more malicious than that, a uh, Bosnian Serb who was uh, first accused and then convicted of war crimes uh, had been a former psychiatrist, I guess once a psychiatrist, always a psychiatrist, even if a war criminal and hid out uh, practicing holistic medicine for many years before he was uh, cornered and indicted and tried. Again, fairly recently, physicians have been used to uh, uh, certify uh, uh, prisoners as healthy enough to undergo uh, torture. Uh, again, a, a rather black mark uh, on our white coats. And here we can see, uh, the. In, for those of you in the back who can't read this, the patrolman on a motorcycle has stopped a physician in his car and said, just because you're a doctor doesn't mean you can use the carpool lane by yourself. And the doctor responds, but officer, my ego is so large, it counts as a second passenger. So let's get back to this fellow. We are going to give you a white coat, but just as this fellow has short pants, you're going to get a short coat. Uh, we hope that you outgrow your short coat and eventually get a, a long coat. Uh, but most importantly, uh, short coat or long coat, as your class has presaged in one of the most beautiful oaths not only has a class created, but that anyone I think has created, you have presaged the concept that while you are going to fill your pockets with all sorts of paraphernalia, stethoscopes, pens, pencils, lots of books and charts, your cell phone, uh, perhaps a portable TV set, uh, <laughs> goodness knows what. The most important thing that we want you to do, what your faculty is looking uh, for you to pay greatest attention to, is actually filling the inside of the coat, between the buttons, with somebody who is knowledgeable, compassionate, professional, humanistic, who absorbs and internalizes the good practices you will encounter and rejects and defends against the bad. Thank you very much.
You can't get rid of me yet. At this point, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Victor Schuster. That isn't his white coat, by the way. His is cleaner than that. Uh, Dr. Schuster received his MD at Washington University in St. Louis in 1977. He was an intern and resident and chief resident in internal medicine at the University of Washington in Seattle and a renal fellow, and for those of you who are not initiated, renal equals kidney fellow at the Southwestern Medical School in Dallas. His first faculty position was at the University of Iowa in Iowa City. In 1988, he came to Albert Einstein College of Medicine where he became chief of the Einstein Renal Division, again, read kidney, in 1992, and chief of the Unified Renal Division, Einstein Weiler and Montefiore Moses Division. In 1998, oh, in 1998, sorry. He was vice chairman for research from 2000 to 2002, and since 2002, he has been the Baumritter Professor and University Chair of the Department of Medicine, that makes him my boss, at Einstein and at Montefiore Medical Center. One of my many bosses. In 1995, his laboratory discovered the prostaglandin transporter, a finding he has extended widely to human and mouse genetics, carcinogenesis, lower vertebrate development, and drug discovery. The NIH has continually funded his research program since 1983, somewhat of a record, and in recognition of his research accomplishments, he was elected to two research honor societies, the American Society for Clinical Investigation in 1992 and the Association of American Physicians in 1998. This afternoon, Dr. Schuster will be presenting a talk entitled Great Expectations. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Schuster to the podium. <laughs> 